When I was diagnosed autistic at the age of 10, I learnt to understand what autism is as three main things. Getting overwhelmed, having sensory issues, and perhaps being a little socially awkward. And this was true for much of my understanding of autism during my teen years. However, during my early 20s, following a pretty serious major breakdown, I started to do my own research and became extremely introspective, tying what I'd learnt through that research to my own daily experiences. Looking back at these past years, I can see how much of a positive impact truly understanding my own differences, adjusting my approach, my, my viewpoints, has made on my overall quality of life in the long term. So today, I'm going to rank a admittedly pretty large collection of autism traits and concepts based on the positive impacts that came from researching them myself as an autistic adult. I've designed this basically to be a one-stop signposty like experience for the lesser known concepts of autism related to autism that you might want to dive deeper into yourself on your own autism journey. This is of course very, very personal to me, so if you'd yourself rank these concepts differently to me, I'd love to hear why and what down in the comments. So let's get into it, shall we? Numero one, starting off strong with sensory differences, or what the medical community would call sensory processing disorder. Yes. Understanding your unique profile of sensory differences compared to the norm I believe is pretty massive for implementing sensory adjustments to help reduce anxiety, but also increase one's workplace productivity. It's huge for self-care and overall energy management, which can be an absolute lifesaver when it comes to meltdown prevention, but also overall well-being. It's no surprise that content around sensory differences is such a popular topic on social media sites, and in this case I would say it's pretty founded, it's pretty useful, there's a lot of applications here, and for someone just entering into the autistic community, this can be a really really great place, place, bleh, place to start. A star! Yes, we're gonna go with the UK school tiering system for competency at certain subjects, yes. Our next topic is monotropism. Yes, a relatively, well, I wouldn't say relatively new, but relatively more new than a lot of the other concepts, especially when it comes to the awareness of it in social media spaces. Monotropism is basically the idea of autistic people inherently having a more focused sort of attention style, or perhaps a bit more of a narrow focus window, as it has been described by some. And this concept ties into and helps explain many other of the prior autism concepts that I have delved into on my own autism journey. The concept is absolutely perfect in advocating against problematic behaviour that we hear in a lot of parenting and teaching circles, basically allowing us to advocate for what is an inherent immutable trait within us. For example, if a kid or an adult is focusing on a particular piece of work or a topic, forcing them to change very, very quickly and transition from one thing to another very quickly and then expecting them to be all calm and okay with it is probably not the best way of doing that because that's just not how our brain works. We need some time, we need some preparation. And being able to point to monotropism, something which is inherent to us, we're able to more effectively advocate for those adjustments. However, learning about our focus styles earlier, the different concepts that are already out there, made this concept just a nice, concise way of explaining what I already knew. So, personally, I'm going to put it in the C tier. Our next concept is autistic inertia, and this concept helps explain why it's harder and perhaps more stressful for us to both start and stop tasks, like we're a train. You know, it's a bit harder to get started, but once it's going at full speed, slamming on the brakes, probably not a good idea, might lead to some major injuries. 
I think it's a good way of explaining how my brain works. And it's been very useful for both self-advocating myself at work and relationships, as well as helping me better manage my work and social life with more awareness about, you know, perhaps how I would like to chunk things in my day. For that reason, I put this concept at A tier. Our next concept is cognitive versus adaptive empathy. And yes, I know it comes from a scientist that a lot of people within the autistic community uh, criticize a fair bit, but I find this concept to be very useful. This is the idea that there are two base elements involved in empathy. Knowing someone is feeling something, which is cognitive empathy, and adaptive empathy, which is what we think of when we say empathy. Acting appropriately, or somehow feeling the feelings that someone else is going through. Autistic people can have difficulties when it comes to cognitive empathy, especially with people of a different brain type neurotypicals, and I do believe that neurotypicals share the same experience with us. But although we can struggle to isolate and understand exactly how someone is feeling based on indirect cues of uh, what they're trying to communicate emotionally, it doesn't mean that we have low adaptive empathy, what most people think of when we think of empathy. We do generally have average or above average adaptive empathy. I think that this explains where the no empathy autism myth actually came from. It advocates for autistic people being seen as humans with real empathy themselves, but perfectly explains why sometimes we can have a difficulty naturally reading those nonverbal cues from neurotypical individuals. I'm going to put this at the A star tier. Yes, we got two there already. Our next concept is transition times, and transition times are basically the window of time between finishing one task and starting another task. Due to our focus style, perhaps related to monotropism, this transition can take us longer for us to do comfortably. It doesn't mean that we can't do it in a short amount of time, it just means that our brain may not adapt to this new thing that we're doing as quickly as other people will, or if we do, there is generally a lot of anxiety that's produced from it. It can also be larger, depending on a lot of other factors influencing our own mental state at the time. For me, this has been great in overall day planning, but it's also helped me adjust my day when my mental health is pretty low. So I'm going to give this the B tier. It's a very impactful but very small thing, so I think this is a good place to put it. <clears throat> Double empathy. Yes. Put simply, it's a concept that highlights how it can be difficult for autistic people to empathise and understand with people who aren't autistic or listics, but also vice versa. It's more something I'd highlight to neurotypicals, as there's a lot of empathy myths in the form of concepts like Cassandra syndrome. Because it's kind of given that this is a pretty large myth, I'm going to put this in the D tier. But I do think that it does have some application, and particularly in relationships and advocacy. It's basically just like categorizing conflicts between autistic and holistic individuals as a result of shared mutual misunderstandings and miscommunication. Our next concept, one of my favourite ones, alexithymia, which is a reduced ability to notice and categorise your own emotions. And it's fairly, well, actually very highly co-occurring with autism, amongst other different mental health related conditions. I can't highlight enough just how much of a positive impact learning about this concept had on my life. This explains so much of my experience with socialising, with emotions, but also with managing meltdowns and my mental health in, in a day-to-day -day way. Understanding why it can be difficult for me to pick up on how I'm feeling or how I feel about things. And generally giving me some more ways 
to understand and to monitor my own emotional state. Plus, I'd say it led to a lot of life-changing revelations about my own experiences, difficulties and behaviours, which all in all just led to a lot of positive changes in my life. So, we're going to give this an A star. Yes. Stimming and sensory activities. Stimming are those repetitive, autism-specific movements that we do to regulate ourselves. And sensory activities are the things that we do to meet our sensory needs outside of stimming, or at least in my conceptualization. The reason I won't put this in the A star tier is because although stimming is talked about a lot by autistic people online, genuinely for myself, I haven't found much benefit to being aware of them, because mine are so unnoticeable that I've never really been called out on them, and I've never really suppressed them all too much. And a lot of the sensory needs that I have are generally met through activities that I already do, that I already enjoy doing. However, there's no doubt that it can be beneficial to be aware of and follow up on for a lot of newly diagnosed individuals. So I'm going to give this an A tier. Our next concept is a bundle of different things. I'm going to squash these all into one, one um, section. Cortisol signs, faux regulation, trigger stacking, and the Coke bottle analogy. This is a collection of concepts related to anxiety and the cortisol stress hormone. Faux regulation occurs in autistic people, whereby we look calm, relaxed, regulated on the outside, but internally we have very, very large feelings of anxiety or dysregulation. This is very applicable to places like the dentists, the doctors, the hairdressers, and pretty much in a lot of social situations to help others understand that our anxiety, our feelings of dysregulation aren't always visible, at least when they're relatively background emotions. Trigger stacking is often used to help owners understand how stress can stack up from different things during the day in dogs, leading to a strong reaction to, albeit very, very small stressful things. I think the reason why this concept has been helpful is because it, it, it does apply to humans too, because we do experience cortisol. And for autistic people, our cortisol can be elevated further than normal and stick around a little bit more than usual too. So it helped me understand why I can have a meltdown over very, very small, minor things in my day and generally help monitor my capacity day to day. So if I'm struggling during the day, I have lots of different things that are happening that are stressing me out. You know, perhaps that last thing that kind of tips me over the edge, like not being able to find my keys or something for like five minutes, whilst usually I would be able to cope with that fine, it may just cause me to go into a meltdown. And it helps me highlight that it's not me losing my keys really that always causes me to go into meltdown. It's the combination of different things that I experienced during the day. Lastly, the Coke bottle analogy has been used to help parents and teachers understand why some autistic children, after going through a school day, have meltdowns when they get home. With the Coke bottle analogy, it's not necessarily the sort of home experience, the home environment that's causing them to have a meltdown. It's the pressure or the anxiety that's built up through the day that only gets let out when they're in a safe, comfortable space. I think this can help parents understand where these meltdowns may come from, but also help partners who see us as masking our distress at social events only to melt down when we get back, as not putting it on, as it not being a result of <laughs> being around them, sort of one-to-one, -one, but actually as a result of that pressure, that anxiety building up over time. All of these helped me a lot in advocating for myself, managing my energy, but also understanding my unique relationships to anxiety 
and preventing meltdowns. So, I'm going to give this an A-star tier. <laughs> My lordy. Very biased um, list of traits so far, eh? I, 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 it's it's going to get a little bit less. I'm not going to put everything in the A-star tier. I promise. I promise. Thin Slice Judgments. Thin Slice Judgments are basically initial impressions in a concept. What people see in like the first few seconds of meeting people, dictating how they think that person is, despite having more interaction with them, more conversation. I think this generally highlights a lot of the unintended social discrimination that neurotypicals can have for autistic people in social and workplace environments. For example, I watched a presentation from somebody who had a very, very bad experience with somebody who showed a lot of autistic traits. And so in the future, for them, they highlighted these traits as red flags for interview candidates. So when people would come in, if they showed some autistic traits, he would highlight them as red flags and therefore not employ them. But being aware of this initial bias, being aware that what he's actually looking for are autistic traits, helped him reduce that level of bias on choosing workplace candidates. I don't think this had too much of a large impact on me. I kind of knew that people generally didn't uh, get to understand who I, who I truly were in the first instant. You know, I have a lot of people making very wild claims about my personality based on not knowing me for a long time and are quite often them being completely separate to who I am as a person. So I'm going to give this the B minus tier. I don't know if I have a B minus tier. We'll put it in the B tier. <laughs> Our next concept is infantilization and mate crime. And I've lumped these two together. Infantilization is basically treating an adult as an infant, something that a lot of disabled and autistic people experience, where people kind of talking over them and sort of patronizing them and not really sort of respecting them as an adult, as they would a neurotypical adult, perhaps. And mate crime is basically a concept that covers how some people take advantage of autistic people and disabled people to gain some kind of advantage or manipulate them in some way. I think, obviously, these two are pretty notable forms of manipulation and disrespectful behaviour, and being aware of them can help you identify them a little bit easier. However, this hasn't had the biggest impact on me. It's had a small impact. I'd say that probably I'll put this in the B tier too. non pathologizing language. non pathologizing language basically reframes concepts, usually medical concepts. These are generally concepts that we don't need to be assigning value to. Autistic advocates generally reframe language to make them more neutral, to reduce that those value judgments that people place on them in order to say that they're negative and, and say that we need to change them. Although it can be a pretty useful concept and something that can help with communicating different aspects of the autistic experience, with like a lot of these different things related to like the socio-political world, they haven't been all too applicable in really having a strong change in my life other than communicating with other autistic people a little bit more respectfully and effectively. So I'm going to put this in the D tier. Pathological demand avoidance, PDA, or the non-pathologized version, persistent drive for autonomy. Basically, pathological demand avoidance is this concept that, that that seems to be apparent in some neurodivergent individuals or autistic individuals, whereby they really, really struggle with expectations that are put onto them. Quite often this manifests or is understood as avoiding doing what other people tell you to do. So it's sort of like a an extreme version or a diagnosed version of, you know, sticking it to the man, I guess, in a sense. But a lot of people don't really understand where this comes from, 
and being aware of PDA for myself has explained my aversion to authority in certain cases and also explain why I struggle with people telling me what to do but don't necessarily want to tell others what to do. So it helped me understand that it wasn't some kind of weird power dynamic thing but it was more related to the expectations that people had on me. And being aware of this and communicating with my loved ones, my family, my partner, my friends about this generally made a lot of things, things a lot clearer and also gave them some other options for asking me or communicating with me and what they want me to do uh, whilst being a bit more cognizant of my PDA tendencies. Interoception, something highly linked to alexithymia. Interoception allowed me to better understand my own EDs, eating disorders, but also my awareness of my own needs, allowing me to take care of myself better. Interoception is basically the awareness of your own bodily signs. So hunger first, you need to go to the bathroom, temperature, things of that nature. And generally I have a very dulled sense of interoception. And so a lot of the time, the things that have been beneficial to me is to try and develop a routine about around eating or set reminders, basically outside sources to encourage me to eat and to drink and hydrate myself that aren't just internally derived. Not something that I go, oh, I'm thirsty or hungry. Because if I did that, generally I would be very malnourished. <laughs> and also very dehydrated. So I'm going to give this hmm, a B tier. Next concept, internalized ableism. Indeed, and we will go into ableism a little bit later. Basically, internalized ableism is being ableist towards yourself. Ableism is discrimination against people who are disabled. So in this context, discrimination against autistic people. A lot of beliefs that people have when, when they are experiencing internalized ableism tend to be sort of little things or, or things about themselves or their personality related to autism that aren't things that they want. You know, they have this idea that they want to be normal. They strive to be neurotypical in some areas. And that can lead to a lot of self esteem issues, but it can also be pretty unrealistic to a lot of people. I think understanding the concept of it has been quite useful, despite people quite frequently within the autistic community labeling anything and everything as internalized ableism. This generally helps me remove a lot of these self-defeatist like attitudes that I have around being autistic and look through a more individualized lens on what I can achieve in life and what kind of supports that I need and also feeling okay with that, feeling happy about that, feeling accepting it to some degree. So I'm going to give this an A tier. Self-identification or self-diagnosis. The reason why I call it self-identification is because diagnosis is generally something that is done by the medical community. It's kind of like a medical word. And a lot of people have negative associations with the idea of diagnosis or self-diagnosis. So I use self-identification, but it's basically the same thing in, in sort of everyday use. I'd say that it's a very, very beneficial concept to understand because the medical system is there to diagnose problems. So understanding that, could there not be autistic minds out there who have a lot of autistic related traits but don't necessarily have any problems with them? Well, of course. And are there a lot of potential issues with getting a diagnosis? Yes. Are there a lot of things that are in the way of people getting a diagnosis? 100%. You know, uh, in a lot of cases, people just knowing that they're autistic and learning from other people, learning about autism and implementing their own things into their own life, not necessarily going for a, a medical diagnosis, um, I think is, is 
pretty okay. Having access to valuable resources, having a understanding community around them. I think generally this is the best way to go for a lot of people because even if people do go on to get a diagnosis, if they're late diagnosed, <laughs> they're an adult, um, they're, they're going to get to a point where they self-identify as autistic, at least to be aware of it to go and get the diagnosis itself. I do realise that it's subject to a lot of ignorance thoughts from people outside of the community, but also hyperbolic-like statements from reactionary individuals, but I think being aware of this and understanding it as a concept is very important and has changed a lot of my own personal views about autism in general. So I'm going to give this an A tier. Autistic burnout. That experience that we have as humans burning out, but also the autistic variety. <laughs> the experiences of burnout that come chiefly from autism related problems and issues that we face day to day in general living. Executive function, sensory stuff, social stuff, but also what it looks like and how it can impact us differently compared to most people experiencing regular old burnout. I have a very long video about this cycle of autistic burnout that a lot of particularly conscientious individuals can go through, but this concept generally has been quite useful for me in a sense, because I have a diagnosis of depression, and for myself it's very hard for me to pick apart what is autistic burnout and what is depression. So in terms of managing it, it hasn't really had that much of an impact on my life, but it has, I suppose, highlighted the potential causes of things and allowed me to make changes, particularly when I'm in my my low periods. You know, someone says during depression to get out and socialize a bit more. Perhaps that might be useful if I was feeling very, very depressed. But if I'm in autistic burnout, perhaps I just need to take my foot off the, the pedal a little bit and get some regulation time. So I'm going to give this the A tier, autism tier. Yes. Unintentional gaslighting. Yes. Basically, where somebody denies your lived experience, your, your experience just in general, in a way to sort of reframe it and benefit you. Think of the example of you struggling in a busy sensory mess of an environment, and you have a lot of anxiety, you're really struggling with it, you want to go out, you want to put some sensory supports on, but someone tells you it's not too bad that perhaps you're overreacting a little bit, that you can cope with that sensory situation. That would be a good example of unintentional gaslighting. It's not something that's done in a malicious way, but it is something that happens. And I suppose being aware of what this can look like can be very, very helpful for people who are surrounded by others, close ones, friends, acquaintances, who don't particularly understand autism although they are denying your experience and sort of overwriting it in a sense, that they're generally doing it out of ignorance, but also positive regard for yourself, which I think can be very, very useful to understand. It's basically a more well-rounded and less accusatory insight into how autistic experience can be overwritten or ignored. And so I'm going to put this in the B tier. Our next concepts are shutdowns and meltdowns, which are two different things, but I'm going to bundle them up into one point. Shutdowns are the experience where autistic people can become very quiet, dissociative, and sort of detached from their environments, perhaps sometimes not being able to speak, perhaps sometimes not being able to act as much. This is an experience which is, as I would describe, a protective thing to stop us from getting too overstimulated, like the general function of dissociation. Meltdowns, on the other hand, are extreme, emotionally charged, horrific, <laughs> um, crazy experiences that a lot of autistic people can have when we get too overwhelmed. And I think generally understanding what these can look like, what you can do to prevent them, 
what you can do after. Generally has a lot of use for a lot of autistic people, including myself. I particularly like contents that focuses on challenging the shame that people feel around these experiences, advocating for more awareness of them, helping people understand what to do and how to act if somebody is going through one of these experiences, but also dispelling the myths and opening up understanding of the impacts that such an experience can have on us. So I'm going to put this in the A star tier. Definitely an essential thing to understand as an autistic person. Oromotor needs, an aspect of our sensory needs that isn't talked about too much. Basically related to our need to chew. The proprioceptive mecha <laughs> mechanoceptive feedback that we get from chewing things. I think this was pretty good for understanding why I tend to snack so much. Generally, getting this need met has helped a tiny bit when it comes to regulation and also stopping myself from doing unhealthy patterns. And so I'm going to put this, admit, sadly, I'm going to put this in the F tier because it hasn't really had that much of a big impact on me, but it might be useful for you if you find yourself chewing on lots of different things or grinding your teeth or doing things of that nature. Hydration break. Yes, I do have a two litre bottle of Pepsi Max, and now I am not sponsored, sadly. Our next concept is personal language preferences, which is a big group for a lot of the different preferences in language that autistic people can have. It can range from autism, Aspie, OT. Uh, it can also be related to person first and identity first language. This generally does vary a lot from person to person. For myself, it has been beneficial in basically taking ownership of my own identity as an autistic person, as it being something which is immutable from me. Something which, although is not all of me, something that is a big part of who I am, and if I was to remove autism, I don't think I'd be the same person. Basically, if I haven't explained it too much, identity first language would be, I'm an autistic person, Person first language would be, I'm a person with autism. There are a lot of different ways that people can use this or have, have different personal language preferences, but it generally varies a lot person to person. So that's why I'm putting it in detail. It's not really that transformative and helpful for sort of daily life, daily living, but can be beneficial to some people for um, identity purposes and potentially advocacy. Rejection and sensitive dysphoria. RSD. Yes. RSD is basically a extreme negative emotional response to feelings of rejection. And for people with RSD, things that aren't usually considered to be indicators of rejection, very, very small things, could cause someone to feel very, very rejected. And it could impact them a lot in their relationships, their friendships, in a lot of different situations. It could even be in work. I think generally this concept helped me understand my potentially over overly emotional and anxious attachment style that I had when I was younger. It's not something that I struggle with anymore, but I think learning about RSD and how autistic people can often sort of develop this due to past experiences with rejection has been very, very beneficial. So I'm gonna put this in tier. Our next topic is neuro-inclusive parenting and teaching. I think in general this is a really good thing to understand, particularly for people, autistic people, who are thinking of becoming parents, and even people who aren't autistic who have autistic children. I cannot emphasize how much of a great movement this is, because it incorporates autistic live experience and neurodiversity into how we raise our youth, which can be very, very beneficial in combating not so great teaching practices that we're not going to be talking about today for fear of some kind of backlash or suing from the company. Who does it? You know what I mean? I'm not too sure if I'm going to have a child. I may do. But generally, having awareness of this has been very, very beneficial in my own 
teaching experience, but also understanding how the way that we advocate for autism as adults can have some impacts on future generations. Our next concept is vocal monotony and flat affect. Vocal monotony is basically what it is. It is talking like a robot. Like, I, I, I don't know if I have to put it on because I feel in general that my voice does have a certain monotone feeling to it. <laughs> you know, it's you, you can't see it as much me doing this video because I tend to sort of express myself a little bit more than usual. The other concept is flat affect, which is a reduced amount of emotional expression on your face. I think this concept helped me understand why certain people may accuse me of being unfeeling or unemotional. It helps me understand a little bit more about the potential miscommunications that I can have with holistic or neurotypical individuals. And so it has had a little bit of impact, more or less just explained my past experiences. So I'm going to put this in the detail. Mirroring and movie mimicry. Yes, two, two very strange concepts. I'm, I'm sure people understand what mirroring is. Movie mimicry, it's a little bit more out there. Mirroring is basically what, what actually a lot of psychologists do with their patients. Uh, mirroring body language, vocal tonality, different things like that. It's also something that manipulators do a lot as well. And it's also something that a lot of perhaps high trait agreeable people might do to build rapport with other human beings. It's something that some autistic people do as a form of social camouflage to help them fit in with people. And the concept of movie mimicry is basically isolating a certain fictional or TV character or film character or book character and emulating that in your own life. Very strange concept, if you haven't done it yourself, but if you have, like myself, it helped me understand a lot of my own teenage behaviours and also brought to attention how I can be sometimes a little bit of an emotional sponge when it comes to mirroring. You know, when you mirror someone's outward expressions, uh, the way that they, they are, the way that they're talking, the way that they're reacting, the way that they're sort of expressing their feelings, Sometimes doing that yourself kind of has a feedback loop into affecting how you actually feel yourself. So mirroring is, an, is, is and can be very useful, I guess, but in the same vein, it can be very detrimental if you feel like you're just soaking up every person's emotional energy to a certain degree. So I'm going to put this in the C tier. Our next concept is executive dysfunction. Oh no. Basically, your ability to manage your own thoughts and in the context of daily living, your own life, your schedule, the things that you have to do, um, making small decisions every, every day, basically. This can be very, very beneficial in work and life because generally life consists of a lot of adult things that we have to do like cleaning and cooking, the small things that we have to maintain on a daily basis, lots of little, little small different things that we have to do that for most people can be admittedly a bit boring, a bit tiresome, but for us can take away a lot of our energy. Understanding executive dysfunction has helped me a lot in advocating for my own needs, seeking supports in the workplace or for, in, during life, but also giving me a way of isolating what the issue is and understanding how my mental health and my mood can affect how I sort of manage my own life. So because of this, because of the impact that it's had on me, I'm going to put this in the A star tier. Definitely an important concept to get your head around, to understand, to make adjustments for as an autistic person. Social reward and oxytocin. This particularly was highlighted in my podcast that I did with me, Abby Shields, where we talked about the impact of THC. There's basically this THC-related oxytocin mediator that can help a lot of autistic people feel a lot more reward, enjoy social interaction a lot more than they usually would. I found that a lot of the things that hold me back from interacting with other people is not necessarily social anxiety, because I'm a fairly confident person, 
It's just that I don't enjoy it too much. And so I don't have enough of a urge, enough of a sort of ignition to, to want to start conversations. I think understanding this has been interesting as an insight into my own brain, but potentially not too impactful in my own life decisions. So I'm going to put this in the D tier. <laughs> Excuse me. Our next concept is divergent thinking. And this can take many, many different forms. It's basically the different perception that we can have as autistic people, the different ways that our brains can work, which allow us to think in out of the box ways. I'd say, you know, despite this just being an understanding of, you know, perhaps how my brain works, it can actually be really useful when it comes to selling myself in job interviews, but also advocating for my own perceptions on autism. So I'm going to put this in the B tier. Well, we're just going to take a little bit of a break because we've gone through an, um, an enormous amount of different topics and concepts. If you are enjoying this so far, please make sure to like, subscribe, comment what your thoughts are at the moment. A little bit of a self promo, I know, but it's a long video where we're getting through it. You're in for the long haul. <laughs> Our next concept is ARFID, Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. This is basically an experience that some autistic individuals can have, particularly during childhood and potentially adulthood, whereby our diet is restricted in certain ways. I'd say that this is or could be a useful concept for a lot of people, but it hasn't been that useful for me because I've never had ARFID. So, this is going to go in the F minus category for me. Ableism. Yes. What, what I was talking about before, internalized ableism. Probably would have been a better idea to put this before internalized ableism, but here we are. Here we go. I'm recording. <laughs> so let's just do it. Ableism is basically the discrimination of a person based on autism in this case, but also related to disability. I think this has been useful in identifying the ways in which people treat me differently to other people, perhaps in work, social situations, relationships, but also advocating for myself in situations where it happens, where it's employed. Particularly when it's related to my own innate, immutable autistic traits. Things that I do have to advocate for because it's not something that I can change. So I'd say just because of that fact, just because of the variety in which it can be applied and, and how it helps me advocate and help other people understand the ways in which I can be discriminated against, I'm going to give this an A tier. Our next concept is social camouflage, or better known as autistic masking. Camouflage is generally split into three different aspects. You've got assimilation, compensation, and masking. Masking is basically the act of changing your outward behavior, the way that you talk, the way that you express, to better match what holistics are like or neurotypicals are like, which can sometimes be beneficial for keeping us safe and also helping us sort of integrate ourselves into groups to prevent loneliness. It can have some really, really negative effects on our own self perception, our own formation of our identity, and also our energy levels when we are doing that. I avoided interaction a lot in secondary school. I didn't used to mask. I used to avoid situations, so I used to compensate. I didn't really talk too much. And so it was a little bit harder for people to pick up on the fact that I was different. However, when it came to university, I did start to mask. I developed a lot of internalized ableism. Yes, and I wanted to mold myself to be more neurotypical so that I could have an easier time with friendships and dating. And although that happened, it also brought with it a lot of negatives for my own self-identity. You know, I looked in the mirror and I, I, I didn't understand, there was no connection between what I was on the outside in the company of people to what I was genuinely on the inside. So overall, this had a really positive impact in highlighting internalized ableism that I had, but also the ways in which me masking has negatively impacted like how much socializing I can do. 
how comfortable I feel, how connected I feel to other people, you know? If you put up a mask in front of yourself to meet and find people, people are going to be attracted to that mask. They're not going to be attracted to the authentic you. And so there are so many different aspects to this which have had positive changes in the way that I view myself and the way that I conduct myself. So I'm going to put this in the A star tier. Yes, where it belongs. The next concept, central coherence. Basically, seeing the bigger picture, pulling information together, processing ideas in context. Someone with weak central coherence might find it difficult to figure out what may come after a phrase like, Thomas took out his credit card, placed it in the card reader, and, you know, most people would say, put his pin in and then take the card out and, you know, that's all done and dusted. Someone with weak central coherence might find it very, very difficult to understand what may come after because it's related to the context of it. Although it's an interesting concept, it hasn't really been all too impactful to me because I don't have an issue with it in adulthood. I don't even think I had an issue with it when I was younger. So I'm going to put this in the F minus tier. Code switching. This is the idea that we as human beings shift and switch our behavior slightly in one way or another, depending on who we are around, but also depending on the situation that we're in. I don't really do this naturally all too much, but it helped me understand why people act differently in different situations and different environments. Because it did confuse me for a long time why people did this. You know, if I had a conversation with a friend one-to-one -one, and then we went into a group, they seemed to be different to how I interacted with them when we were just having a chat. This didn't have too much of an impact on my life in any way, but it did explain, I guess, a little bit more about how humans can be in different situations. So I'm going to give this the D tier. Dissociation. Dissociation is an out-of-body-like experience. You can feel disconnected from the world with derealization or from your own body with depersonalization, or you can have a mix of the two like myself. I experienced this all through my life pretty consistently up until a few years ago. I think due to the experience of shutdowns, meltdowns, and sensory overload, I would consider this to be pretty heavily tied to autism. It helped me understand that I wasn't crazy for this sort of existential, disconnected-like experience. And noticing dissociation, just in general in myself, in my day-to-day -day life, has helped me determine how overstimulated I am in environments. So if I feel very, very dissociated, I can, even though I don't or can't really put my finger on why, it gives me an idea that something in my environment is causing me to dissociate and therefore potentially something is overstimulating me or causing some kind of negative emotional reaction, which can be beneficial for me because I'm alexithymic. But we will go into alexithymia. Oh no, we already did. Yes, we did. This list is very long. You'll have to excuse me. <laughs> Functioning labels. I have separated this out from the language preferences because I think it's just a little bit more nuanced than what type of language people want to use. Functioning labels is the idea that someone is high-functioning autistic or low-functioning autistic, which I think in general can be a pretty bad way of looking at autism. You know, autism for a lot of people is viewed as a spectrum of different traits, and obviously people are very, very different on the spectrum. You can't just lump autism into high and low functioning. Generally, understanding someone's um, functioning, in a sense, can help in healthcare and medical settings, but it's definitely very inappropriate to use socially or just off the cuff, especially with an autistic person. And personally, I prefer using support needs as an indicator of what someone's needs might be. Because it may be that someone would be described as high-functioning like myself, but it doesn't erase the fact that I have some support needs. 
as opposed to other people who are autistic, they may have no support needs. Or they may be considered to, ha to be more autistic or, or low functioning and have very, very minimal support needs compared to myself. So it's, it's a bit of a silly, it's a sort of silly way of cat categorizing autistic people. And being aware of this, I think, can do a lot for advocating for autistic people. Also understanding how autism can be different for different people. So I'm going to give this the D tier. Refrigerator mothers. My God. You know, there's a lot of myths and misconceptions which do impact autistic people, autistic adults, but there are also a lot of things and concepts and myths which impact autistic parents too, making them feel a lot more isolated and judged compared to parents of neurotypical children. The idea of refrigerator mother comes from this assumption that autism is caused by cold parenting, which is silly because autism is neurodevelopmental, meaning you're born with it. So it's it's pretty much nonsense. However, it didn't really have much value for me or impact for me to, to know about because my mother is probably one of the warmest, loveliest people that I know. So we're going to give this the F minus tier for its impact. Neurodiversity and neurodivergence. I think it's important to understand the concept of neurodiversity, especially in our modern times. Looking at the, the sort of socio-political side of autism, perhaps. However, I do use this concept a lot in explaining the different aspects of autism, but also with advocating for myself in social situations. I'd say nowadays it's more of a label and a statement unlike the paradigms and different models of disability, which we're going to go into. So just because it is such a sort of transformative and perspective shifting concept, I'm going to give this concept, these two concepts, the A tier. What about the neurodiversity and pathology paradigms? I'm also going to give this an A tier too. The neurodiversity paradigm argues that all difference is valuable, all neurological difference. Whereas the pathology paradigm argues that there is a normal or there is an ideal. Basically highlighting things as not being correct and therefore in igniting people to want to fix them and return them to the ideal or to normal. Although I'd recommend looking into this a little further along in your autism journey, due to its complexity and its nuance, and also, you know, how applicable it can be to just an individual's life. However, it can be very useful for advocating for yourself, understanding why others may treat you in certain ways, and understanding its sort of place in the socio-political landscape. Just like the neurodiversity and pathology paradigm, the medical and social model of disability has been very helpful for myself, understanding the role society has in shaping what we consider to be disabling, and where my perceived negative traits may actually come from. Quite often, a lot of people assume that because you have a disability, because you're autistic, a lot of the problems that you have are all centralized around you and your autism. Whereas this isn't really how it pans out when we think about, you know, life as an autistic person. A lot of the negatives that we experience are from interactions between us and systems or us and other people. Not all, of course. The medical model of disability basically puts all the blame for any difficulties that we can have as autistic people onto us and the autism. Whereas the social model, I think, better integrates, you know, the idea that it's not necessarily innate that we could have these problems, it's because of the interaction between us as a different person with a world that's not necessarily built for us. And so I'm going to give this the A tier too. Echolalia. Echolalia. <laughs> Echolalia is basically the concept of repeating phrases or noises something that has been related to a lot of autistic people. I think this helped me understand my echolalic students when I was teaching, 
you know, how they communicate, how they communicate what they're up to, what needs, what, what kind of choices they want, the way that, and, that, and how people, individuals use echolalia can give a lot of insights into what they're trying to communicate with you. Even though it is quite atypical and to a lot of people it can seem like it's not really valuable in a sense. I think it's also interesting when I catch myself doing it with a partner or friend. However, it hasn't really had much personal impact on my own life, so I'm going to give this the D tier. That's a C. <laughs> what am I doing? Perservation! Yes. Perservation. What, what is that? Basically, a behavior where you do the same thing over and over again. Like, for example, you know, you've got, you've got some chips in front of you, or fries, as you Americans call it, and you just keep picking up the salt and salting it and putting it back down, and then picking up the salt and salting it until there is no salt left in the, the, the glass salt dispenser thing. That's an example of preservation. I do find myself doing this sometimes during meltdowns, but I don't think it's helpful for anything other than helping others understand or to, to explain why this happens to them. There's not really anything that they can do to help me unless it's, you know, something that, that, that is particularly harmful. So I'd say that it's relatively quite insignificant for me to understand as an autistic adult. I'm going to give this the F minus tier. Elopement. Basically, a word that describes the tendency for some children, usually autistic children, to run off, basically. And it's something related to an ability to sort of process the potential danger to themselves in different situations. Not really applicable to me, so it's going to go in the F- minus tier too. Another concept is joint attention. Joint attention is basically when you look at something that someone else is looking at too. Something that I don't generally do as much as other people when I've observed it. It's something that my mother talked to me about. She's a teacher. She does, you know, she teaches kids with special educational needs for a living. And although it's very interesting, it hasn't really been that applicable to me. Autism acceptance versus awareness. Many advocates prefer autism acceptance to autism awareness, since awareness is passive and othering, whereas acceptance requires actual work and leads to belonging. I do sort of agree with the premise and the, the sort of logic behind this. However, I do think they are both very key, and education is perhaps a key step in between awareness and acceptance. It's, it's okay, like, I understand wanting people to accept us, but I guess in a sense we're, we're almost assuming that people are aware of autism and that people understand autism. Because it's quite difficult for a lot of human beings to accept something that they don't know about or don't understand. I guess it can be a good concept and it can also be a way to pick apart different pieces of social media content, content as being like red flags and autism community related things. So I'm going to give this a D tier, just because it, it doesn't really have much of an impact on me, but it, I suppose it's quite useful to know. Sensory avoidance versus sensory seeking. This is basically a label, a piece of general terminology that we use to describe if a person seeks out sensory things or avoids them. Yes, it's very self-explanatory. Um, quite often, we may see people generally describing people as sensory seeking or avoidant, but due to the differences in our sensory profiles, what we like and don't like, we're obviously going to have a mix of a lot of different things. So I think it's a lot more applicable to explain it in the concept, in the context of individual sensory things. Not really that useful, I guess. Like, hasn't really had that much impact, it's just kind of a piece of terminology, so I'm going to give it the F minus tier. We do have another concept around the sensory world, which is sensory defensiveness, which I think actually does have some applicability to my own life and understanding myself. Basically, the idea is that when we have control over certain stimuli, certain sensory inputs, it can change the way that we behave in response to it. For example, you might 
find it very difficult and very intrusive and very uncomfortable to be hugged just out of the blue or have someone touch you out of the blue. But initiating verbally or verbally accepting a hug or physical contact might be absolutely fine and even something that you would want, you know? Think of a stranger coming up and giving you a hug versus a partner giving you a hug. It's, it's a little bit different. So I think in general, this helped me understand how controlling different sensory things affects my tolerance to them. For example, music and flashy lights and physical touch versus music that's ambiently playing and, and the noises that occur in my environment, uh, bright white fluorescent lights, and touch that you know comes from people that I don't know very well who are trying to comfort me by placing their hand on my goddamn shoulder. I hate that so much. So we're gonna give that a I'm gonna give it a B tier. You know, I initially thought C tier. I'm gonna bump it up a little bit. I think it is quite useful to understand. Our next concept is one page profiles, which is kind of a businessy workplace type tool but it is very, very useful for a lot of people. And it's actually something that I used to do as part of my job, I used to create one page profiles for people. I think this can be an amazing tool for those who struggle in interviews, who struggle explaining different aspects of their personhood, their experiences with autism, and also with introductions to workplaces and with health professionals. It basically takes a lot of the pressure off a person sort of verbally introducing them to somebody else and can generally pe give people something to look back on and something to reference and something to basically have in their back pocket to understand the best ways of communicating and working with another individual and also perhaps what are their strongest traits or different things that they need to be aware of when it comes to their disabilities or their autism. So I think it's a very good thing to be aware of, uh, especially if you struggle with any of the things that I've talked about. So I'm gonna give this the B tier because it has been useful for me in some circumstances. Next concept is differing eye contact. Yes, the experience of autistic people either making very, very strong, comfortable eye contact <laughs> or really, really struggling to make any eye contact at all. I'm going to give this the F minus tier because under actually understanding it negatively impacted my social experiences. You know, I, I sort of, when I was younger, during my masking, I would force myself to make eye contact, which more often than not actually derailed me from the conversation, paying attention to what the other person's saying, reduced my energy levels, and also just, just made, made the whole social interaction just generally more uncomfortable. It's like having to keep track of multiple different things when you get to masking. So as I actually understanding my differences in eye contact has brought some negatives, but when it comes to, I guess, tactfully using masking during interviews or during confrontations to keep myself safe, it has been a little bit useful, but I'm going to give this the F minus tier. Next, we have black and white thinking and splitting. I mean, they're the same thing, it's just a different way of explaining it. It's basically thinking on the extremes or by certainty. For me, it's not that I think like this, like I'm not a black and white thinker, it's just that I prefer certain black and white easy things to understand. It's a preference and not a description of how my brain works. I do actually enjoy exploring the grey areas of life. I mean, it's pretty much, you know, central around the things that I talk about. I love speaking about the nuanced grey stuff. Understanding this helps to spell a lot of the misconceptions that people can have about the way that I am and the way that I think. So I'm going to put this in the C tier. Let's do it. Prosody, I think that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> Prosody is how people change the rhythm, the loudness, tempo, and pitch of what they're saying to convey different meanings. They're basically the indirect communication that is that, that sort of exists within what someone is saying that changes the meaning of what someone is trying to say can be something that can be 
perhaps quite difficult for a lot of autistic people like it was for me. I think it's very helpful to understand this in terms of miscommunication, but also understanding the subtle indirect communication others can use, or at least noticing the the impact of how they say stuff and, well, not calling them out, but noticing the differences to ask them about what they mean. Generally, when I communicate, my words mean my words. The way that I say stuff doesn't necessarily dictate what I'm trying to say. For other people, the way that they say stuff can have a very, very large impact on what they actually mean, or what they're trying to communicate. And so understanding this, just out of understanding other people and the indirectness of you know, how people can say things to make other things mean different things, it's very complex. <laughs> I'm going to put this in the B tier because it has been quite useful for me communicating with holistic individuals. A Fantasia, something that I've heard about a lot since starting my channel. Basically, a Fantasia is a difficulty mentally visualizing images in your mind. Some autistic people experience this. In my experience, it's more like hyperfantasia. I can imagine things in extremely crisp detail. I think it's a very interesting concept, it doesn't have any applicability to me, so I'm going to give this the F minus tier. Strength based approaches. Yes, this is basically highlighting, amplifying, and using strengths of a person and their neurology to the full extent. Trying to minimize weaknesses or work on them till it's manageable or it's at a acceptable level, or getting support for them, which I believe is amazing for personal growth. Constructing your own individualized life path as an autistic person, but also your job, your relationships, everything. I think that a strength-based approach is one of the more impactful things that I've come across in my life. And it has really impacted the way that I view myself, you know, quite often as autistic people, especially if we experience a lot of that internalized ableism, we can often really focus and really try to fix the things that we find to be very, very difficult. There are things that perhaps holistic or neurotypical individuals might find pretty easy. However, flipping the script and really focusing on what I'm very, very good at and amplifying that and trying to construct my life around that has been so, so beneficial to my overall well-being and my experience in life. So I'm going to give this the A star tier. Yes, it's been a while since we put one in the A star tier. <laughs> Aspie or Asperger's? Aspie is basically a shortened version of Asperger's syndrome meant to denote people who are diagnosed with it. I think understanding the history behind the label, understanding the history related to Hans Asperger, can be very, very useful to go into to be aware of the history of how autistic people have been treated. I'd say that it hasn't had too much of an impact on my own life, although just having that context, just being aware of it has been fairly beneficial. But I'm going to put this in the D tier, mostly because it's not used anymore, really. Some people use Asperger's and Aspie because it's something that they're diagnosed with. Some people just like it, some people see Aspie as a reclaimed word, but it's not even used in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Health anymore because it's been changed to ASD 1, 2, and 3. I think, it, it, you know, D tier is probably the place for it. Special interests or SPINs, very interesting acronym. Remember sort of commenting on someone's post asking what SPINs were? special interests, I think it's, it's, it's a great acumen. I, I didn't know about it until recently. It covers the obsessive-like tendency of autistic people to focus around one thing, learn about one thing, basically engage in life through the, the lens of that one area of interest or topic. It gives a great idea of what these obsessions are, why they happen, and where they come from, but also how to harness your interest in certain things to make productive things or activities easier to do, or at least in my case. I think it's kind of overused 
to a certain degree, as I think sometimes people, even autistic people, just have interests. They don't always have to be obsessive special interests. But yes, of course, we can have special interests too. And I think just in general, it can be a good way of bonding with other autistic people and sort of starting a conversation. So I'm going to put this in the C tier. Synesthesia, the experience where your senses, your neurons are sort of crossed in a way so you can hear colours and smell sights and do all sorts of crazy cool things that I wish I could experience <laughs> to some degree. Some autistic people do experience synesthesia. However, it's not related to me. It's a pretty cool concept to learn about and ask people about. But other than that, not really that impactful on me. So I'm going to give it the F minus tier. The next thing is a collection of three different things, which is augmentative and alternative communication, AAC, or PECs and signing. Basically, different ways that autistic people can communicate with other people. PEX is basically this picture-based system that some schools and parents use to help kids who have a difficult time verbalizing their needs or their desires um, to be able to communicate, basically. I think it's it's been helpful for me in teaching to know about, but it's also been helpful in situations where I go situationally mute, which I will go into, during shutdowns or meltdowns. But it's generally not very applicable to me at most of the stages in my life. It's only really during those times. So I'm going to give this a, you know what, I'm going to give it a C tier because I think it can be very, very beneficial to understand and know about, especially if you are in the autistic community. School, workplaces and events accommodations. Autistic accommodations. This can be related to equipment, the curriculum or the work done communication and environmental adjustments, as well as assistive technology, sensory supports, and much, much more. This has helped me so much in my uni experience during work. And although it's not a flawless system and it's not accepted by every single institution, even though it should be under the law, it is definitely very, very important to be aware of if you have a formal diagnosis or in some situations within certain organisations, if you are self-identified autistic, you may still have access to these accommodations. Being aware of these can do a lot for you if you are struggling with certain aspects of working life, with going to certain events. Just being aware that these things are there for you can take a lot of stress out of things and possibly give you access to situations that normally you wouldn't be able to access. So I'm going to give this the A star tier. Our next concept is selective mutism, or it is reframed as situational mutism, because a lot of the time it's not an intentional thing that we do. I think that understanding situational mutism has been massive in helping me advocate ahead of time before I get into difficult situations where I dissociate or have meltdowns or have shutdowns. I think just this fact in general, being able to communicate this to loved ones, people around me, that this is something that can happen, can help alleviate a lot of the difficult situations that you can get in when someone doesn't understand that you can't speak. It's not like you can tell them that you can't speak. And it offers different routes to communicate when you aren't able to, like what we're talking about with AAC. A lot of the times when I'm unable to speak, I'm usually able to nod. I'm usually able to shake my head. I'm usually able to squeeze. And so we can use those different ways of communicating to um, better, under well, that they can use it to better understand what I want and how I'm feeling. So I'm going to give this the a star tier. Our next concept is social scripting. Now, a lot of people can find this quite useful. It's basically giving sort of a blueprint or a framework for having conversations with people, especially if you find it quite difficult to do so. I find that in situations where I've needed this um, and, tr and tried to use it, I think it m 
more just brings me out of the conversation and causes me to panic if things don't go how I expected them to go. Personally, I believe that it's better to learn on the job, practicing with close ones or observing others in social situations. Personally, I haven't found a lot of use in this, but I imagine that it can be useful for some people. So I'm going to give this the D tier. Misophonia. <laughs> the bane of some people's existence, but not mine, because I don't have it. Misophonia is characterized by the experience of strong negative emotions of anger and anxiety in response to certain everyday sounds, such as the sounds generated by other people eating, drinking, and breathing. Not related to me. Plus, personally, I don't know what you could do about this if you know that you have misophonia. So although it's quite interesting and I think a lot of people experience it, I'm going to put it in the F minus tier. EDS, or Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. EDS is basically a group of connective tissue like disorders or problems where the symptoms generally occur around loose joints, joint pain, stretchy skin and scars. It's actually not something that a lot of people know about and it's not something that a lot of medical professionals know about either and it is fairly tied to being autistic. So I think understanding what EDS is can be helpful for a lot of people Personally, it's not something that I experience, so I'm going to put it in the D tier. Spoon Fairy. Yes. A lot of people's favourite ways of managing and visualising their daily energy expenditure. Basically, the idea is that you have a certain amount of spoons to spend during the day, and different activities take away certain different spoons. And for some people, having that visualisation can help them manage and visualize their energy. However, for myself, I find it way too complex and unreliable and pretty hard to use in advocating. So generally what I do is I chunk my day up and adjust for it the next day if I need to. I don't use Spoon Fairy. Other people can find it quite helpful and it is talked about a fair bit. So I'm going to bump this up to the C tier. Fairy of mind or mind blindness. Theory of mind is defined as the cognitive ability to predict and plan people's actions by understanding their perceptions, beliefs, and desires. Basically being able to sort of get inside someone's head. <laughs> Not literally. It's something that's very highly contested by a lot of people within the autistic community. I think generally it was quite helpful for me when I was younger, so I did tend to be quite egocentric in a sense compared to people around me. But I think just like the ideas of empathy, it does lack a two-way street, meaning it's probably going to be quite hard for a neurotypical individual to understand our perceptions, beliefs and desires because they're different to us. So it's, it's a little bit one-sided in a sense. And it, to be honest, isn't too applicable for me in adulthood. So I'm going to put this in the, I'm going to put this in the D tier. <laughs> I hope you guys aren't switching off during my incredible rant on different aspects of autistic concepts, because I, I, I started writing this list, you know, and um, when I started writing, I was like, oh, there's a lot of concepts here. However, I'm, I'm not going to go too in detail on any of these, so I can't imagine it taking too long. And here we are, two hours later. <laughs> Our next concept is object permanence, which isn't applicable to me at all. It's basically the idea that things exist even when you can't see them. Um, if you don't have object permanence, you may completely forget that something exists or think that something exists if you can't see it in your vicinity not really applicable to me, so I'm going to give it the F minus tier. Prosopagnosia and BDD. Basically, severe face blindness. Milder experiences of this have been connected to autism by some autism advocates talking about their own experiences. 
And I know that from looking into the concept of body dysmorphic disorder, basically a condition where you sort of focus on different aspects of your face and become very, very overly self-conscious and critical of them. This idea of BDD has been connected to autism in some respects, and a lot of people theorize that this is related to differences in how we see faces. I think this has been somewhat beneficial to me because I do have some BDD-like symptoms in my life due to the fact I do a lot of video editing and I sort of post my face quite a bit. And so really understanding this connection and understanding more about these two conditions, perhaps a more milder form of prosopagnosia, I guess in a sense, um, it has been very, very beneficial to me. So I'm going to give this the B tier. And if someone has a bit more information on prosopagnosia, sort of the more severe sort of general medical term, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. Co-occurring conditions. Very broad. I know. I mean, I could list every single other condition or thing which is related to autism, but this would be a very, very large addition to an already very large list. So I'm going to bundle everything into one bit. Co-occurring conditions. I think this is actually pretty massive for a full picture of an individual's autistic experience. We're often not just autistic. And so it's very useful being aware of these alongside being aware of autism, as it can help you understand the ways that we can be different as autistic people, why they may happen more, but also help us search for more specialised therapy for something that we're struggling with, one of these co-occurring conditions. And so due to this fact and due to the breadth of things that it covers, I'm going to give this the A star tier. Melatonin and sleep differences. Yes, indeed, we autis can find sleep sometimes very, very difficult. And quite often we can require a little bit more sleep than our neurotypical counterparts. I think understanding about melatonin and the differences that I have in terms of sleep has been massive for combating my own sleep issues and understanding why I have difficulties with them and why I may need more sleep than other people, why I may need to rest more than other people. I think generally having a good conceptualization of the ways in which our melatonin and sleep cycles can be in compared to most people can be very, very beneficial and they have been for me. So I'm going to put this in the A tier. Definitely something to look into if you struggle with the old sleep. Processing times. Basically, the time it takes for you to process information. And this can be related to people talking, commun communicational wise, but it can also be in terms of thinking about things. It can be in terms of doing work. I think that this is absolutely ace in advocating with overly chatty people or in an argument. It helps me get rid of the feeling of being stupid or pressuring myself to communicate faster than I'm able to. I think this gives a good insight into my mental state too, because generally when I'm not doing so good, my processing time tends to be a little bit longer. I think this can do a lot of good in a lot of different areas, so I'm going to put processing times in the A tier, just for its impact on my own life and the potential impact on other people. Meltdown, hangovers and aftercare. Yes indeed, I termed these two conditions, or at least I haven't heard them in other areas, you know, people may talk about them. These are two terms that I came up with myself. Meltdown hangovers is basically the sort of sluggish, um, sensitive state that we can get in post having a very, very traumatic and difficult meltdown. And aftercare are the things that we can do and that other people can do to alleviate some of the stresses that we can feel or some of the thoughts that we can have, which are of a negative variety. So for myself, Generally, after I have a meltdown, especially 
if I'm in the company of other people, I can feel a lot of shame. You know, it, it can be hard sometimes to have this this level of communicational ability and sort of functionality in life only for it to go completely down, you know, completely zero out. It can feel very, very vulnerable and produce a lot of shameful like feelings for me. And so being aware of this and also being aware of my needs post meltdown can be very, very beneficial to me. And so I'm going to put this in the A tier. Bottom up processing styles. This is a style that a lot of autistic people can have, whereby we take down details first before putting them into understanding a big picture, which is different to how other people may process, where they understand the general concept first and then understand the details after. It's sort of like taking different phrases and pieces of information from different articles and things that you read and compiling them into a paragraph. It's the details before the concept, essentially, instead of the concept before the details. I think understanding this helped me a little bit when it came to my university days, but not too much because naturally this is just how I think, and this just helps explain why I learn best and think in this way. So we're going to put bottom-up processing styles in the D tier. The next concept is patternicity, or pattern seeking or pattern thinking. Basically the ability of autistic people to better spot patterns in things that other people perhaps won't see. I think this is also a very good way of selling yourself in interviews and it explains why sometimes I learn things, learn new things, so quickly. I spot patterns in different things. Once I have a pattern going it's very easily replicable for myself. And so I'm going to put this in the C tier because I think it's a very important concept to understand as an autistic person, or at least something to point to as a strength of our sort of innate being or innate neurology. Don't know if that makes sense. You know what I mean. We're going to put it in the C tier. Boy, that's what I'm talking about. Analytical, lateral, and associated thinking. Perhaps examples of what we would consider as divergent thinking. Autistic people often show more logical consistency due to our analytical thinking styles. Lateral thinking makes us good problem solvers by tying seemingly unrelated things together, and associative thinking can be helpful in generating creative ideas. It's kind of this similar to patternicity, pattern seeking. It's just a good way of selling yourself of understanding your strengths. And so I'm going to put this in the D tier. And ladies and gentlemen, this is our last concept, our last point that we're going to be talking about today. God damn. This is the concept of integrated masking, which, you know, obviously it's something that I'm going to put in the spotlight, something that I've come up with myself. Integrated masking is basically the idea of being aware and in control of masking and using it in situations you feel able to do for your own benefit or safety without losing yourself or neglecting your own energy levels or just generally being unaware that you're doing this in the first place. I think this is huge because a lot of people that I've talked to in the autistic community generally rely on this and can be often quite aware of themselves masking their autistic self. It's not that they just do it because they feel the need to shape their entire identity and existence to be more normal. It's just that they see the benefits of this and they're willing to take the negatives of masking during those times. And when they feel they're in safe spaces and they're able to unmask, they do so. Although this might be a point of contention that a lot of people have with my own perception of masking, but I think it's a very, very good way of conceptualizing how one can understand and navigate masking in our modern day. Because wouldn't it be so lovely if people just accepted and didn't make judgments about autistic people? Sadly, we're not living in that world. Living in 
And uh, our safety, our progress in the workforce can often be hinged upon people's perceptions of us. And so integrated masking is going to go in the A star tier. Whew. My God. God damn, that was a lot of talking. My brain is fried. I'm done. I'm gone. <laughs> I'm going to have the world's longest chapters section in the description that anyone has ever seen on the site of YouTube. <laughs> so, guys, if you have found this helpful, please feel free to bookmark it and return to this to use it as a resource for yourself in finding new things to learn about autism. But please do like and subscribe for future videos where I do explore a lot of these concepts in a lot more detail. This is just a general overview, a general explanation, general descriptions. And this is also, you know, as I said, from my own personal experience on which concepts me knowing about have had the most positive impacts on my autism journey. If you want to support me further and see my year's worth library of live streams that I do, you can do so in the membership section for as little as one pound to join the Auti Legion. It helps me out so much as I recently went self-employed and I need as much evidence as possible to show my work coach to show them that this is a viable life path. It would help out a ton, but if not, no pressure. Glad to have you here. Please let me know your thoughts down in the description. Description. <laughs> Guys, my brain is fried. Oh, my social oh, social battery, that's another one. I'll chuck that one in. Why did I not include social battery? Why are there still more things that I could talk about? Social battery, a way of visualising the amount of social interaction that you can handle. I'll probably put that in B tier. You can think of some other stuff, chuck it in the comments, I'll give it a rating if you really want me to. I'm done. I'm done for today. I'm done. Goodbye.